Um, I thought uh, initially that I would sort of start by telling you a little bit about um, who the people are that you're talking to so that you have an idea of what they might be most interested in. Um, so the, the classical podcasts are aimed um, at the current students at the Kirov, prospective students at the Kirov, uh, their parents. Uh, those students are of pre-college age mm -hmm. um, and um, they are now ballet and music. Um, there's uh, a 30 year rich history of ballet and the music division uh, is a um, fairly new addition to, um, to the Kirov Academy. Um, and one of the things that the podcasts strive to achieve is to give them an idea of what they need to know beyond just the practice room. In some cases, it's, you know, what do you need to know before you go to audition for, let's say, Juilliard? Or what do you need to know before you go to compete at, let's say, you know, the Tchaikovsky competition? Mm -hmm. um, but where I thought um, the, the, your area of expertise would meet their um, area of not knowing um, is the, the real world industry of music, um, where it intersects with radio, where it intersects with, um, you know, the, the backstage realities of, well, radio as well, but also orchestras, uh, other artistic institutions and so on. Given your uh, history uh, with uh, operetta and opera in Baltimore, I thought that would be uh, an interesting insight, um, but also, of course, your um, history and uh, expertise on radio. So with all of that in mind, can you tell them a little bit about your background? Um, you know, did you set out to be a radio broadcaster? How did you start? Uh, I did not actually set out to be a radio broadcaster, although people said I had the voice for it when I was as young as 15. So wow. it was always in the back of my mind, yes. Yeah, th this voice showed up when I was about 12, so. You know, <laughs> and that must have made school very easy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tremendously. Um, so I got to college. I transferred to the University of Iowa as a sophomore, and I was studying English. I thought I might want to be a university professor. Um, unfortunately, at that time, there were far more people coming out with PhDs in English than there were decent gigs for them. And so I was thinking, well, do I want to stay with this? What do I want to do? Um, my family wasn't really into the fact that I would rather have majored in theater. So that was another thing. But anyway, I met someone who was a graduate assistant at WUI and KSUI, which are the professional public stations on the University of Iowa campus. And he suggested that I audition for a student announcer job. And by audition, I mean that they had me read some composers' names and some performers' names and try to make it sound as if I was back announcing a piece. And that was for KSUI. Since WSUI was news, I had to rip and read some copy. We literally printed it out back in those days and read it rather than just Real read time. It. Yeah, exactly, as, as one does now. And I passed the audition. So I was working on WSUI first. I would go in about 11.30 Sunday night be on the air from midnight until five and then go to class at seven in the morning. Wow. <laughs> yes, things you can do when you're very young. <laughs> well, things that some people can do when they're very young. Remind me to tell you sometime about the class that I slept through most of my uh, graduate years. Ooh, ouch. Yes. Uh, well, there may have been significant amounts of caffeine involved as well. <laughs> I, so, that I, I thought, yeah. Was, yeah. It a paying, was it a paying gig already was or was paying. it? Yes, 585 an hour, princely sum. $585 an hour, right? Yes, no, $5.85. Yes, that's... So I was fortunate that I wasn't relying on that to pay for my education, but, uh, you know... It no, but nice it, it's, it's not just, you know, that you already had resume uh, material when you, when you graduated, but, you know, it was paid... You could officially and, and uh, honestly say that it was a paid radio broadcasting job. Right. It was different from being on the student radio station where the only people who got paid were the program director and the news director. So it, it did have a little more clout. Mm -hmm. And the program director on the classical side is friends with Jonathan Polevsky, who has been oh. for almost 27 years now. So, so, I, I have... <laughs> so the, the, the University of Iowa, this, this also bears examination. 
Um, what kind of um, student body do they have? What like what size student body do they have? They they could support uh, two different uh, radio stations. That that seems remarkable. Mm, yes, the the student body at the time I was there was about thirty thousand mm -hmm. in undergraduate and graduate. The town that my parents grew up in had the same number of people as my dorm, which is one thousand five hundred. <laughs> wow. We had the International Writers Workshop in my building. They had the, the graduate students in the International Writers Workshop were on the top of Mayflower Hall. So I'd get on the campus bus in the morning and hear all these different languages being spoken and hear people from all over the world talk. It was really cool. It was a great place to go to school. That That's really a, a bit of a godsend. I mean, not just the exposure to the, the uh, the business that you would, you know, end up pursuing, but um, also the much wider view of the world, mm -hmm. which again uh, touches on what what I find a lot of students to need um, right around the time that they decide that they're going to go into any kind of artistic field. Um, we are limited usually by the the hometown, and of course, if your hometown happens to be Seoul or New York, uh, you know, you you're going to be uh, urban. How much? how wide your exposure is within that town is another matter, of course. But then, of course, you might be coming from a smaller town. You might be coming from an area where you are unaware of, you know, what it means to be international. Um, right. And, and your choice of school and the, the, the choice of um, the, the, the school's composition in terms of the variety of its student body, I think, um, is something not enough people weigh. No, absolutely not. And I can't say enough in, in term, favorably in terms of that. Because not only did we have the international students, we had the students from all over the United States and all kinds of different backgrounds and you know people that were completely unlike me, but we had certain things in common, whether it was music or literature or what have you. Very different backgrounds, but very similar uh, goals and, and interests. Mm -hmm, exactly. Did, did you know to look for that when you were choosing the university? Did you and your parents uh, sit down and, and look at like demographics or did you uh, luck out? Uh, I lucked out and I have Sandy Karnak to thank for that. She was the first theater director that I worked with. And I was also trying to be a writer at the time. So I was trying to get into the undergraduate writers workshop at University of Iowa, which never ended up happening. But she thought that it would be a great school for me just because of the environment and the very active art scene. We had a facility, I think it's still there, called Hancher Auditorium, where like the Joffrey Ballet would come through and do performances. They did a performance all to music by Prince, who, is, as you know, is one of my idols. And, I didn't. I, oh, really? Believe it or not. Believe it or not. I didn't know that. You haven't seen all those Prince posts on Facebook? I mean, <laughs> no. Okay. And a professional. A uh, company came through a touring um, the English concert with Trevor Pinnock. I mean, we we had things that you don't associate with a, a community of 50,000 in Iowa, but because the university was almost as large as the town, we were fortunate enough to have those opportunities and they had great ticket prices for students. So it's, again, it was just a fabulous place to go to school. Um, once you were on radio, was it... Uh... Now, now looking back, was it similar to what you would experience at uh, WBJC or uh, did it show itself to be a student station? Uh, no, no, no. It was very professional. I mean, again, we had full time announcement and the students generally started on the less desirable shifts like midnight to five. And then if they liked you, you moved up the food chain and you might get to be the sub for the weekend edition local host when that newscaster was ill or on vacation or something or the morning edition host or all things considered during the week or, you know, the regular afternoon classical host. So you, you had to prove yourself. It took a while. Right. And um, how many people uh, like right now, there's uh, three people at WBJC whose names, uh, you know, are familiar to, to listeners uh, in the area. There's you, there's Jonathan, uh, there's Judith. Um, how many uh, broadcasters were there uh, Were there in Iowa? Let's see. On the classical side, I think we had about four or five full-timers. We actually have five on-air people here. Um, mm -hmm. We have myself, Judith, John Search, Kati, and Jonathan. Six, wow. Um, Kati, well, Jonathan, of course, doesn't have a regular air shift. He goes on again to fill in for someone and to do 
his specialty programs and that. So in terms of the on-air stuff, I think we were pretty similar. And the full-time people did only one or the other, only news or only classical. But the students, if they had the interest, um, bounced around. There was one incident, unfortunately, where a very, very nice man who primarily worked on the news side went on the classical side and said, be open on the for the most part. <laughs> I, I will never forget the, the Victor Borga rejoinder when somebody in the audience yelled out Beethoven and he said, Beethoven, are you making fun of my accent? Oh, oh, he was great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you, you do obviously um, have a, a specialization necessary for classical radio. Mm. Uh, you know, not, not like uh, you don't need to know uh, current events for news, but... Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a narrower field, shall we say, when you're announcing um, uh, announcing recordings. Um, yep. So when when you came to Baltimore and you um, uh, got the got the position at WBJC, uh, I understood that you were um, in Baltimore for other things. Uh, no, I, you mean in terms of having visited before? No, no, in terms of uh, operetta, in terms of singing. Oh, yes. Um, I had been singing in choruses since middle school, and I had done opera chorus both in Minot, North Dakota, where I grew up, and then at University of Iowa. Actually, in college, I was in the music building so much that the director of choral activities was completely confused when I showed up on non-major voice juries day. He was like, what are you doing? <laughs> so anyway, so I got to Baltimore. Um, I immediately joined Baltimore Choral Arts, and then I was with BSO Chorus. And when that group was disbanded, I had been studying voice quite a bit the whole time, um, as I did in college, and I got up the nerve to audition for Baltimore Opera. And, and, I, oh. I, in, and I had seven wonderful years of doing sometimes the full season with the company. We were hired on a show-by-show -show basis, and mm -hmm. there were years where I got all four contracts, and it's just, it's the most fun ever. <laughs> the most fun I ever did you prepare with uh, a coach and, and the whole shebang, or was it just you by yourself in the practice room? Oh, no, 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 no. Suzanne Chadwick was my teacher at the time. And then when she moved a little too far out for me to make lessons work with the whole job thing, I studied with John Van Cura, who's another fabulous teacher. Gotcha. And then, and then while doing that, um, you, you were already working at WBJC? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, the opera was great, but it was not enough as a, a, to be a full-time income. Yeah, well, yeah. that's that's another thing that I think uh, surprises some students of mine uh, when I point out that there are orchestras in America um, where, you know, given the news stories about those orchestras, negotiations between musicians and management, you might think that, you know, an enormous amount of money is at stake. And then you take a look at what the players are paid and you realize that's not a full time salary anywhere, even for a small town. Um, mm -hmm. You know that the the positions where uh, you are paid and paid well um, and don't need to take any other jobs if you don't want to those positions are um, you know far fewer and, and obviously much more uh, competitive. Yes, and um, I think continue go ahead. in the future. I, I really do, and I, I mean most people, like you say, do have to teach or have an office job or take on private students or, or that sort of thing, and that's anything artistic, whether it's acting, singing, playing violin, all of uh, dancing, all of those disciplines. Yeah, we yeah. all have. Well, and I, I sometimes think it's, you know, partially financial and partially just, uh, you know, one's interests, one's uh, area of interests is likely to be much more broad when you're in the arts. You, you come into contact, uh, you know, with, with a very wide um, variety of, of uh, specializations within your professional life. Um, so you might get pulled this way and that. Um, there's a pianist known to both of us who is uh, getting into singing, um, you know, not to mention years of composing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so once you're, once you're in, um, you know, ensconced at WBJC, uh, can you tell people a little bit about what, what the daily life is like, you know, so you, you come into work. What is it that work entails? Yes. Uh, well, work entails preparing for the air shift, which I generally do while I'm doing another air shift. Some people like to program on the fly, like they'll have one or two pieces that they've chosen before they get in, and then they just do everything 
on the Whatever go. Whatever, literally on I, air? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I find that that's for technical disasters and all kinds of other funds. So well, I witness, like to program. Witness our, our get together this, this afternoon. Um, you know, Murphy's Law, anything <laughs> that can go wrong will go wrong. My, my children first managed to hide exactly. the iPad and yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if you're programming literally while a piece is playing and you're going, so what shall I play next? Um, some people actually have the audacity to do that. Right, right. And that, that's just not how I operate. I'm more of a planner than that. So I was programming next Tuesday while I was on the air today. And we have a wonderful program called Music Library. And that's, that's what we use to select the shows. So we can say, okay, I want a 35 to 37 minute piece by Tchaikovsky. I want this orchestra and this conductor and the program will bring it up. Wow. Okay. So you're, yeah, it's when very you are cool. doing programming, your first, your starting point is the piece. Mm -hmm. and usually, or sometimes I think, well, I really want to play something American next. It's again, that varies um, tremendously by day, by the person on the air. You can think, well, I haven't played a Leonard Bernstein recording in a while or, you know, something of that, of that nature. And we're very fortunate at WBJC because at many stations, you walk in and the program director or the music director has chosen your entire show and they hand you a list and you look at it and go, and again, uh, we don't do it that way here. The announcers do choose their music. I have noticed uh, about classical stations uh, in the US though, that the uh, selection of performers um, tends not to sort of dig into the golden oldies archives of, you know, performers pre, let's say, 1970. Um, so you, you do yes. choose. Go ahead. Oh, I lost you for a minute there. I, I was, I was just saying that, you know, I, I had noticed that, uh, you don't see a whole lot of, you know, early recordings by David Oistrakh versus current recordings by, let's say, you know, Josh Bell. Um, you, you, you tend to see, or at least I have tended to see, uh, programming of uh, living performers. Is that uh, inaccurate or is there is that accurate and is there a reason? Uh, the biggest reason why we wouldn't play older recordings would be audio quality. Gotcha. You know, if, if we look, yeah, if we pull something off the shelf and if it says it was recorded in 1958 or whatever, it could sound totally fine. It mastered beautifully and whatever, and it could sound not great. So that that's usually the thing. Yeah, you you do have to the give a factor to the yeah. uh, sound in someone's car as they're as they're commuting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. a question of how people use radio, and and some people just won't put up with a scratchy recording. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about how people do use radio. Uh, I mean, what what do you know of the? How do you know of the listenership and and uh, you know where they um, access your product, um, and how do you know that? Uh, we rely on things like the Radio Research Consortium and listener feedback and uh, talking with colleagues at other stations and, and things of that nature. So, Sorry, the, the screen yeah, was like, freezing for a moment. For example? I, I said the screen was freezing for a moment. Um, you you please, said that you rely on the Radio Consortium, you rely on... Sorry? ...to do to talk... I'm having some audio. Issues, uh, so I'm, I'm having some move, audio. move my phone around a little bit. I'm on. Uh, I think we're better now, but I'm not sure. You, you were you were frozen, so I knew that. There was, yeah. Yeah. Um, it it yeah. may be just the Wi-Fi signal. Um, but at the risk of at the risk of belaboring the same question, um, so there there is feedback. Um, is it uh, sort of uh, measured in any uh, official uh, you know st statisticians measuring it kind of way? Uh, is it more anecdotal? Like for example, in terms of audience feedback, the sort of people that will uh, call into a radio station or write into a radio station and, and say they like this, they didn't like that. Um, that's a, you know, sort of self-selecting sample size. So how do you find out what it is that people 
um, you know, like and, and what it is they object to. Uh, that's true. It is kind of self-selecting, but you know, the, the, those tend to be the people who are members, and we are about seventy percent member-funded, so that is a factor as well. You know, and, and again, you look at things across the industry. You talk to colleagues at other stations. You people talk to you when you're at events, and so it may not be a hundred percent scientific, but some stations really got themselves in trouble in the 1990s by listening to focus groups and things of nature, uh, they were told that music was not the thing to do, that they should get rid of their classical music entirely. And a lot of stations did. And in some cases it was all right. And in some cases they're fundraising tanked. Yeah, exactly. There was, there was so an article years ago. Tank. Sorry. Oh, no, we're fine. Yeah. Um, I had the same thing, a uh, phone ringing, uh, uh, there was a wonderful article years ago by uh, Dave Barry, um, who made the analogy with uh, newspapers that, that you know, I, I actually make the analogy more with uh, classical radio stations, but also with, with other uh, arts delivery platforms. Um, his uh, point was that a newspaper sees its readership going down, says we need to attract new readers. Uh, young people, they don't care about the things that we're writing about. We need to write articles that young people don't care about. What do they care about? Well, they care about skateboarding. So we're gonna do a bunch of articles about skateboarding and interviews with skateboarders and so on. Uh, meanwhile, the subscribers who could not care less about skateboarding open the newspaper and see that there, you know, there are now uh, 15 articles about skateboarding. They call in and they cancel their subscription. The newspaper sees yes. that the subscriptions are going down. They say, well, we need to run still more articles about skateboarding. Uh, you know, and three years later, the newspaper is in chapter 11 or you know, just broken up for parts. Um, so. Your um, your experience with with the classical scene is exactly that 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 people got the wrong message through perhaps even you know official channels uh, focus groups and whatnot uh, took away the entirely wrong message and then proceeded to remove the the very thing that they were created to provide. Yes, and we noticed that the more music we provided, the more talk we took away because there used to be a lot more a talk and whatnot on WBJC, but we noticed that the more music we gave people, the better we did when we fundraised. Of course. No, I mean, it, it seems to be, to you, it seems to be, you know, self-evident. To me, it seems to be self-evident, but it might actually come to a surprise, as a surprise to, let's say, uh, an MBA um, who would, you know, with, with their common sense, uh, think that People need a certain uh, selection of news, certain selection of talk, certain selection of opinion pieces, and then, you know, uh, whatever programming. Um, yes. But I'm, I'm happy to hear that your experience has actually been that more music, not less, is the answer to uh, a music uh, crisis. And so are we. And we have had the best fundraising this spring. I mean, I've it's been phenomenal. We did basically a quiet drive. We made a few announcements per shift that we were fundraising and we asked people to donate online. And we've had some online fundraising for years, but not all of our listeners like doing financial things online. So some people stepped up and did this for the first time and we heard a lot about how much they liked it. And how so sort of easy and intuitive it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, how easy it was, how and say they can do it whenever they feel like it you know they don't have to worry about getting put on hold or a busy signal or anything so yeah, certainly uh, we we feel our, very grateful uh, i think that our contributions to wbjc my wife uh, i think um you know fills out something online I, I don't remember her picking up the phone to call uh, i certainly don't remember writing a check you know so it would have been automated somehow um the um the um, online drive uh, began after Corona hit? Yes, yes. We fundraised in May. I'm fuzzy on the exact days at this point because, you know, Corona brain, pandemic brain. We all, I think we all have at least a little bit of that at this point. There was, but there was yes, January, we've been in the was pandemic and, the, and with the office stuff. I'm sorry. You saw, the, you saw the, the 2020 calendar that has January, February, yeah. December. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. I, I keep thinking, is it December yet? <laughs> if I'm not hearing right. jingle bells, no. 
<laughs> I can tell by the temperature at my house. <laughs> yeah, right. It depends on whether my my gas bill or my electricity are are uh, uh, really high. Um, so, do you think that actually the the uh, Corona, um, you know, unprecedented uh, crisis that it it has actually uh, gotten people who might have been more passively, uh, you know, consuming music to consume it more actively now, like to contribute to I radio. I hope so. I hope people. You know, there, we're, our listenership has been tremendous. Our ratings were phenomenal the last time they came out, so that's good. And I hope people are. Uh, listening to things like the BSO broadcast and streaming the Metropolitan Opera, um, you know, things of that nature. I I see a lot of posts about it online. People sharing yeah, what's going on. I, I, yeah. I'm seeing I'm seeing both sort of the the tragic and and the optimistic uh, posts. I'm seeing uh, you know colleagues whose entire seasons have been canceled, uh, uh, you know, whose orchestras are furloughed and so on. Um, I'm also seeing people uh, noticing that they are getting viewers either on their private, you know, um, YouTube or, or other broadcasts or for the, the streaming things for, for their uh, organizations, uh, viewership that far exceeds any turnout that they could have had in a hall in person. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm just wondering whether there is some room, do you think that there is some room for hope? Um, to to bring in uh, the the viewership the listenership that uh, the musical music industry has been trying to bring in for decades i certainly hope so one concern that i have and that i've seen a number of friends express is how to monetize that how do right. the performers get paid well i think one thing that the advent of the internet in general and things like youtube and and uh, facebook more uh, specifically have have shown is that once you can gather eyeballs, or in our case, eardrums, um, a sufficiently inventive mind can monetize it. Of course, there's advertising, but you know, th there's other ways. The key thing is to have the um, the attention of a significant enough portion of the population that your uh, field is not irrelevant. Um, speaking as someone who was brought up in a classical musician family, I, I remember somewhere in adolescence, coming to the realization that that which surrounds me 360 degrees, my mother being a violinist, our friends being musicians, my, my entire life being in music, um, that this was not standard for people. There was a moment where I actually realized that. There was a moment where I realized that just because the name Yasha Heifetz was uh, as familiar to me as the name George Washington, it didn't mean a thing to, you know, to most people that I met outside of music. Um, and from there, the, the realization that what we do um, is is kind of peripheral in, in America to a large um, has that. Uh, we're frozen up here. Let me see. Our screen just went dark, but you look like you're back. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I was just going to complete that entire thesis with saying that my only room for hope now has been that it, music may show itself to be less peripheral than musicians thought. More people might have been consuming it than we knew. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're introducing their families to it, their kids. Uh, there's hope for that too, because, you know, you don't always, there, yes, there are kids concerts and once kids get to a certain age and that sort of thing, people take them to the concert hall, but maybe now it's something that you can just sit at home and enjoy. Yeah, exactly. The, the non-intimidating um, nature. You know, you, you can consume the, the product at home in pajamas eating Cheetos as you, by the way, would a football game. You don't have to buy a $250 ticket to the Super Bowl, which as far as I know, neither you nor I have ever done. Uh... Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's there's the, the um, idea that for... Uh, for me, getting dressed up and going to a concert hall, for you, I, I know getting dressed up and going to a concert hall is um, an attractive idea. For some people, for many people maybe, it, it is an off-putting one. And while they would then gladly listen to WBJC as they commute, they might feel uh, ill-equipped to buy a CD, back when CDs were a thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
or uh, to uh, certainly to go to a concert and and perhaps be given a stink eye by some you know society person. Um, well, so even if you theoretically would enjoy getting dressed up, there's the cost of the tickets. Um, you yourself have four children, yeah. So you have to pay for six tickets if your whole family went and get everyone dressed and corral them into the car and get to the hall and park. And so, uh, for some people, it's the logistical nightmare of the whole thing. I, I can tell you that uh, the four children means babysitter, by the way. Ah, okay. Um, so there's babysitter, parking, dinner, uh, show. And I can and also tell you that uh, between my wife and I going to uh, a ball game, I actually did go to a couple of ball games. Um, and getting, you know, right? Who knew? Um, ah. And getting, uh, you know, good seats because bad seats are a complete waste of, of the time. Um, getting good seats, getting, you know, some ballpark food uh, between the the transportation, whether that was Lyft or um, you know parking, uh, between the tickets, uh, the decent tickets and the food, that cost more than the magic flute at uh, Kennedy Center. And people don't realize that they have no idea. They they say, oh, classical music prices are so elitist. Uh, we went to a show on Broadway last summer. I'm not going to say which one, but we paid two hundred dollars each for right where we could practically touch the ceiling light fixtures, you know, and, and it, it just wasn't nearly the experience that we would have had at the Matt or Carnegie Hall or something like that. So it's one of these zombie zombie lies, I think, that has made its way into people's consciousness at a level where they're not even aware they think it, yeah. you know, class was expensive and various popular forms of entertainment are not. Um, and, you know, it, it needs to be pointed out that to begin with, that's not true. But one of the reasons it's not true is that um, the bad tickets in a concert will still put you much closer to this, the action on the stage than the bad tickets, let's say, at a ball game, where effectively you're still watching things on a TV screen. It just happens to be four stories high. <laughs> yes. Um, you, you're uh, you're in a in a um, an enclosure that seats twenty thousand people versus one that seats two thousand. You know, you you cannot compare the two. Um, I think the. Uh, the issue of who the the listeners of WBJC had been prior to Corona is one that that bears discussing further. Do you find that? I mean, my my picture may be completely off. My picture is that there were, uh, you know, people like myself, musicians who will turn on the radio, um, and you know, oh, you know, I know him. I, I I you know know about that that recording that they just made. Um, and then there's the the average listener. Um, do they listen at home? Do they listen in the car? Uh, is it an is it appointment listening? Do they you know make time, to, you know, to listen specifically to you um, during your shift? How what have you found out? Oh, that's all over the place. Uh, we have some people who have the station on twenty four seven, whether they're actively listening or whether it's in the background or whatever. Then we do have people who have their favorite hosts or their favorite shows. Uh, the opera fans are particularly devoted. They are passionate, beyond passionate. Mm -hmm. We always do really well when we fundraise for opera. So uh, that really runs the gamut. I, I do know that, of course, most people are listening at home now, and that has been to our advantage. It has been to a disadvantage for public radio news stations. Interesting. Because people aren't commuting. And right. so the listeners are... They're, they're in their home office, and then when they're not working, they're helping their kids with their schoolwork. And, of course, they can get their news uh, on demand from, you know, many, many other sources, online sources, you know, mm -hmm. print sources, et cetera. Um, so since, since the uh, pandemic, you would say that the uh, listenership has not just grown, but also sort of uh, stabilized? Um, it's probably a little bit of, of both, as odd as that may sound. I think we've got a lot of the usual suspects listening even more and people turning to us, whether they're new listeners or people who've been with us a while when they just need a break from the news. Oh, yeah. And it was, that is found after 9-11, and we're definitely finding it again now. Well, of course. I mean, there, there's only so much dystopia you can take, you know, when you... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, there was a wonderful commercial. I, I wish they were still running it. Um, back when I when I was a kid, um, it it was um, on TV back when there was such a thing as cable. Um, and it was um, the sounds of New York. 
you know, the uh, incredible chaos of the subway, the streets, and a calm voiceover says, if this is your day, and more noise and more chaos and subways and buses and, and honking horns, and then the voice says again, if this is your day, and then the picture goes to Lincoln Center at night, and the opening uh, French horn of the Brahms piano concerto, bom, 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 bom. Mm -hmm. and the voice says, make this part of your night. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a great pitch. Uh, people, I think, mischaracterize, oh, classical is so relaxing. It's not relaxing. It is, it, it sorts out the chaos. That doesn't mean it makes you sleepy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It is, it is also whatever you want it to be, really. People sometimes say, well, I don't know anything about classical music. I don't, you know, I, I can't listen to that. I, I'm like, well, do you know how to play guitar? No, but well, you listen to it all, right? Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you, you, you don't have to pass a blood test to, to have your favorite, you know, band. Right. Um, I, I think this is something that probably a music historian can, can tell us how it happened, how the guardians of... Um, you know, good taste became the, the Cerberuses of good taste. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, if, if I look back far enough in um, uh, commentary, I find the sort of the same hand wringing um, dating back from the 1920s that mm -hmm. we have from the 2020s. Uh, you know, the audiences are dying out, the, the people, you know, don't know anything compared to, I mean, Brahms bemoaned the fact that after him, you know, there would be no one who was equipped to be a composer. <laughs> Very modest of him, yes? Well, he I think he was less immodest about it and more sort of apocalyptic, you know, that, yeah. that people... I, I love Brahms. I'm not hating on Brahms, but yes. <laughs> I, I know that you don't hate Brahms. <laughs> I, I, I think there's got to be um, something to uh, the refined nature of music not automatically being something that is targeted at everyone, right? But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you have to have passed a blood test and gone to conservatory and, you know, uh, that that only the elite few are allowed to, uh, to enter the temple of music. Um, so that's why I'm trying to sort of get a sense of who the, the non-musician listeners of WBJC might be, how WBJC reaches them and, and retains them. Um, you know, and whether that there's a lesson to be had there for, uh, you know, from radio to other arts organizations, for orchestras, um, for summer festivals. How how do you communicate with your audiences? Hmm. How do you communicate to draw them in or to keep them or? Both, uh, both. The first to draw and then to, to hold. Yes. Um, I, again, we, well, one thing that we do is we play complete pieces, which I know most orchestras and things do, but, you know, we don't play just the most famous movement of a Beethoven symphony or... The way Pandora would, for example. It's, yeah, exactly. And so that, that's uh, one of the biggest things is not talking <coughs> to your audience, um, not, not presenting it as something, like you say, that's the temple of music, present it to them in say the historical context in which the piece was composed, um, have interesting stories to tell about the composers or things that were going on when, when things were written. And, and that's, that's a big one. Um, it's, it is hard, I think, to, in some ways to translate what works on the radio to what works in live performance. Um, I would say that one thing would be to not, not talk too much and not sort of hold the music hostage. That's something that mm -hmm. we're when when we're fundraising on the air so i think for but, example but definitely give a little background so that um it's not just here's some some sounds make of them what you will right exactly yes yeah um i i've found in my own concerts that um i have this habit developed from years ago from when i was doing the competition circuit uh mm -hmm. and my then manager uh, booked a lot of outreach performances in schools and retirement communities as a way for me to run repertoire mm. um, and introducing pieces to, you know, the residents of the retirement communities, the, the students at the schools. Um, I got into the habit of making little introductions uh, where I avoided anything musicological like the plague. Like, you know, I'm not going to tell you that it's in Sonata Allegra form, but I will tell you that uh, Brahms was a cantankerous kind of guy who uh, actually enjoyed kind of getting under everybody's skin. Um, right. And the, the feedback that I've gotten, 
um, you know, in those less formal concerts and in the more formal concerts, um, you know, anything short of playing a solo with the orchestra where I feel it's not my stage, I'm, I'm a guest. Mm -hmm. um, but in playing recitals, it kind of is my stage. Uh, and in, in those concerts, the feedback I've gotten has uniformly been, you know, I so enjoyed the, the background, uh, even if it was uh, anecdotal, uh, you know, perhaps even funny. God help us, it might be funny. Um, the audiences, I guess, felt allowed to, to enjoy themselves, to not, you know, that they didn't need to have known all of this before. Right. And they may be inspired by what you say to go pick up a book on Brahms. Right. That's great. Right. But if they just want to listen to the music, that's great as well. Right. And um, the, the message of, you know, you can, you can make of this piece what you will. But that being said, you should know that the, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, you should know that this piece was written on commission. Uh, it might interest you to know that Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, here's a musicological fact, Sorcerer's Apprentice could have been and should have been written in 9-8 time, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But Paul Ducasse was being paid by the bar. So he made it in 3-8. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Um, you know, it, it, it may give you a little insight into a musician's mind. And from there, you might enjoy the piece a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, so when you uh, when you are um, going back to the the listenership uh, the viewership as it were of WBJC when you are um, trying to choose programming and you know that uh, people want to hear their Beethoven Fifth Symphony for the umpteenth time but you happen to have come across a work by Fanny Mendelssohn that really deserves wider uh, listening how do you balance that? Um, it's fairly easy. We do have lists of things that we play a certain certain number of them every day, although those a certain number of things from the B list, which is the symphonies and concertos, the very mainstream, you know, standard concert hall works. We have the A list of overtures and things like that. And uh, a C list of things by known composers that maybe aren't quite as well known, like Ravel's La Valse. Mm -hmm. but that used to be about 50% of what we played on the air. And then the announcers had somewhat free range like we don't we don't play a lot of avant-garde works because most listeners just frankly don't don't connect with them um some of those do are symphony programs that we broadcast in the evening so there is an outlet for them whether it's the listener's choice that john search does every friday night um but basically we john's been here about four years the rest of us have all been here over 20 years wow so we have a good idea of what our audience reacts well too so they're they're going to enjoy the fanny mendelssohn they might not enjoy john cage so much you know you get the idea right, right. and uh i mean there's there's the famous um uh, you know industry example the, the sort of warning story uh of the new york philharmonic back when pierre Boulez was the conductor um and their uh, you know subscriber base sort of was decimated yeah. uh, because people on the one hand yes you you do want to have <clears throat> new music <clears throat> and and uh, there's only so many times that you really need to hear the same thing that you've heard before. Um, on the other hand, not everything that is new is, of course, good. Um, and uh, still more, um, people will um, will probably draw the line somewhere between uh, where they feel they're not getting any of the stuff that they crave and they are being force fed the stuff that they may enjoy but equally may not. Right, right. And again, accessible music can be intelligent. And there are plenty of older pieces that we don't play. Because as you're saying, not everything old is automatically good either. Right, exactly. I mean, the, the PDQ Bach experience of, you know, um, I don't remember what, what particular bit this was, but they had a thing where uh, a radio station, a radio station out in like, you know, North Dakota at Hoople, um, <laughs> was uh, playing the 15th piano sonata of this unknown Italian composer. And then they played their 45th piano sonata and it's exactly the same thing. It's in a different key, yes. you know. Of course the pieces are made up, but the, you know, the joke is that there are composers who cranked out music like McDonald's cranks out burgers, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when, you are, when you are listening for, uh, for yourself, when you're listening for something that you don't know what do you like to hear? 
what do I like to hear? Um, I love things with a Russian flavor or a Spanish or Latin flavor. You probably noticed that if you've heard my show, a lot of things like Mario Casanova Tedesco creeping in. Uh, yeah, the, those are things that I seek out. Um, I love vocal music, but that is not something that we play really during the week because again, the, the vocal fans are extremely devoted. Unfortunately, there are a number of people who just don't connect with classical singing. And again, I say this as a classically trained singer and they, they let us know. And, and I had a guy on the phone a few years ago who was very polite, couldn't possibly have been nicer. And he said, you know, I love your station except for two times. There are two times when I just don't listen. And I knew what he was going to say. And sure enough, he said the opera program and the choral hour on Sunday morning. And he said, well, I have to ask you something. You work there. How do you feel about it? And I said, well, sir, I'm in the Baltimore Opera Chorus. And I've been <laughs> like, oh. He felt so awful. And I said, we all have our preferences. It's okay. We're glad you listen. Thanks for calling, you know, but so, right. so that is, that is something, and I don't know what it is. I don't know why that is, but that is something that we have found consistently over the years. So we, we offer our specialty shows vocally and the opera and the choral hour and, and things like that for the vocal fans. Do you think that any part of the, the sort of partisanship of opera um, comes down to the outsized personalities in opera? Perhaps. That could be. That that could be. I mean, I I think the, I think there are fewer stereotypical divas and divos than there used to be, but they do still exist. And again, people have that kind of Bugs Bunny, you know, Wagnerian helmet thing that they they may have had in since they were children. So but maybe that's another unfortunate stereotype that persists. I I can tell you from my experience. Uh, I, I am an opera lover, um, and my. Uh, experience is definitely shaped by the fact that the first operas that I really heard uh, attentively uh, as a student at Juilliard pre-college um, were, uh, first of all, Mozart, not Wagner, mm -hmm. and secondly, um, singers that had a particular sound that I could relate to as a string player. Um, and in later years, you know, still at Juilliard pre-college, but even, you know, later in college and so forth, when I started listening, you know, obviously to a much wider selection of opera, there were singers that I would come across, let's say with a vibrato that is wide enough to drive a truck through with, um, you know, a singer whose, whose notion of um, an accent on a note is to yelp in a way that makes the actual pitch unrecognizable. Right. Uh, and, you know, you, you hear certain singers and, and you think, you know, if that had been the first person that I had heard ever, and if I thought that was opera, I probably wouldn't come back for seconds. That's very valid. That really is valid. And and there are people too who don't connect with it on a recording. Right. Uh, you need to see this thing in the theater. I, I had a colleague, a news guy in Iowa City, who so he was really into punk rock and that sort of thing. And he said, I just don't get the appeal of opera. And I said, Well, you know, John, you're a student as well. Uh, why don't you get a student ticket to the opera? And I can't even remember what the show was, but he went and he came back and he said, I didn't know one guy could do that with his voice. Right. He made the room shake with his voice. <laughs> with his voice. And then and then you point out, and by the way, that voice was not artificially amplified. Yes. Exactly. No little microphone. No, you know, we're talking about one voice doing this over an 80-piece orchestra. Mm -hmm. Right? And not just in terms of volume, but the the, the power, the, the sustain, the length, the complexity, the memorization. You know, there's all sorts of um elements that I think if the audience had their attention drawn to them, look, this is like a circus. You're, you're watching a guy, guy, girl, you're watching a person doing a tight wire walk with no safety net. Right. And I, I think, it is scary. I don't know if it's like this as an instrumentalist, but singing and being out there can be just one of the most terrifying things you've ever done, but it's also exhilarating. In a way that nothing else ever is. Right. Yeah, absolutely sure. the same. I mean, the, the, it's different. I, I find playing as a soloist with orchestra is different than playing um, as a partner in a chamber piece uh, or um, in, in duo with piano. Um, mm. And I, I chalk it up to, you know, I've played probably uh, 10 recitals for every one concert that I've done with orchestra. Uh, I happen to know of at least one pianist who is the exact opposite. Mm. Uh, he, quite nervous when he plays recitals, but he is totally at home as a soloist with orchestra because that happens to be, you know, 
where he did most of his playing. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you are on stage uh, as a singer, as an opera singer, you have the addition of, you know, not wanting to be the weak link in, in the company, not wanting yeah. to let your fellow singers down. God help you if you mess something up for somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And I was one of two people in Baltimore Opera Chorus at the time when I worked there who didn't have a music degree. Everyone, everyone else is walking around with like masters from Peabody and, and what have you. And so that was a little intimidating. That was more than a little intimidating, actually. <laughs> so the, the degree, you would, you would say to a student now that the degree is important if like leaving everything else out of it. A degree is important so that you know that you deserve to be there. Yes. Um, in terms of having the technical background, I would say yes, and and a more in depth knowledge perhaps than someone who just comes in who, in my case, can sing. Um, I would have been better prepared for certain languages like Czech and Russian. Wow. Did while I was there, yes, and and so there, th those were the things where I felt most that I was kind of like playing catch up. I had a lot of stage experience by the time I was doing opera, so it wasn't it wasn't even so much the the music, but the um, the languages I, I felt were quite a challenge. And and Italian, I studied Spanish and French in high school and college. And so sometimes singing Italian, one of the others would come out. <laughs> I, every time I listen to people singing, uh, you know, opera, not not art songs, but singing opera in French, it sounds to me like Italian being spoken with an accent. Uh, <laughs> and I, just me, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, Carmen to me is uh, linguistically, it feels not that much different than, you know, Le Nozze di Figaro. Mm. Um, linguistically, I'm, I'm not making a musical. But like um, story wise, that's quite a leap, Emil, but all right. <laughs> yes, yes. But the, um, it, the musical industry as it stood prior to February. And the musical industry as it will be whenever you know we come out on the other side of this what's your take do you think that um everything will change completely that uh you know things will return to normal something in between there is so much discussion about that both around the radio station of course and online and publications that i read and there are so many ways i think that it could go um the BSO, for example, has installed six robotic cameras at the Meyerhof, and so they're going to have musicians on stage, but they're not going to have audience for a while. They're going to use the cameras, kind of do what the Met does with their HD broadcasts. And I'm seeing theaters doing some innovative seating arrangements and, and things like that. But, you know, you have to have, once you have people back in the hall or the theater, you have to have some protocols, not only for social distancing, for sanitation, not just so that your performers and your staff and your audience are safe, but so that they feel safe. That right. That is going to be a factor. Um, will people want to leave the house for the reasons that we were talking about earlier, the cost and everything, plus the fact that being in lockdown for so long, people have had complete control over what they watch. People have been streaming and you can binge watch six episodes of something or you can watch one and decide you're done for the evening. And, and so that's that's going to be and people might just be so hungry to get back to the concert hall or the theater that they might just not care what it costs or. Yeah, I mean, I, you, to you, you, all can argue this, you can argue that, you know, the likelihood of this scenario or the likelihood of that one, you know, yeah. almost fully. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, how desperate are people going to be to finally be allowed out of the house to finally be around other people uh, how nervous will they be about that very same thing mm -hmm. uh, you know how uh, new and exciting will it be to have someone make your programming decisions for you i'm going to see whatever it is that the baltimore symphony chooses to, to present to me versus i want to hear uh, you know this specific piece and that specific orchestras and that specific conductor's rendition um, mm -hmm. it's I, I hear exactly what you're saying, that that it is um, largely unpredictable. Um, but what I don't hear you saying is that it will go back exactly to the way that it was, you know, uh, an orchestra on stage, uh, hopefully 2,000 people in the hall. Right. I wish that it would. 
Um, I, I, but I have to be cautious about that because, as I'm sure you know, um, orchestras and all kinds of other live performance venues were having issues getting people in the hall even before all of this began. Um, I think one thing that, that probably will go away is the season ticket model. Fine for a while. People don't necessarily want to commit to a whole season with an orchestra or a theater or anything like that anymore because they, they just mm -hmm. want more flexibility. So that, that is one thing that I think will continue to change. I would love concerts to go back to where they were, but I'm just not sure about that, especially 2,000 people in a 2,000-seat hall. I don't think we're going to be able to do that for a while. And then, of course, another question that arises is if you have to socially distance, say, six, six feet between everyone who's not from the same household, how do you sell enough tickets to keep the doors open? Right. Well, I mean, it, that's assuming that you have to socially distance, which is one. Right, right, right. Which I think for the foreseeable future, we just kind of have to assume. Um, I, yeah. I want that to go because I like sitting in a packed theater or a packed symphony hall. But I, I think the reality is that there will need to be some distance for a while. I mean, I, I have found this is where I thought the, the money is not the only issue here, because even if you can uh, take a, a hall that would have brought... I don't know, $30,000 in, in ticket proceeds uh, from uh, the sale of 2,000 tickets, um, you know, at 15 bucks a pop. Um, and instead of that, if you have uh, tickets costing $150 um, for, you know, 200 people, right? Mm -hmm. um, th the, the financial side is addressed, but something that is not addressed is something that I felt as a performer. And tell me if, if you've experienced the same thing. A smaller room filled to capacity has a very different and higher energy level, different enthusiasm level entirely, than a larger room filled to smaller capacity. You go to the Meyerhoff, it's one third full. The applause is tepid at best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, some people just don't feel like they can make noise if there's not anyone else around. So they're, they're going to kind of golf clap, even if yes. they really love you. It doesn't mean you tanked on stage. It's they just don't feel like they have to react the way they might. Mm -hmm. I mean, f finally, we may um, do away with the obligatory standing ovation, and that is also the good, I think. <laughs> yes. Right? Uh, you go, I, I don't know how many of people, you know, watching this have experienced this, but you go to a concert and you think, well, that was okay. And at the end, mm -hmm. everybody stands up as though they're saluting the flag and you're thinking, am I crazy or are they? But you stand up like a lemming anyway. Because you don't want to be the, the jerk who's sitting down when everybody's standing up. I may or may not have been that jerk on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> well, but when I feel I, very strongly about it. Yeah, I mean, if I feel very strongly about it, if, if somebody just brought the house down, I am out of my seat like a rocket. So that's the other thing. Right, but if, if you feel very strongly that this was at best meh, um, I applaud. I'm not rude, but I'm not going to jump out of my seat as if it had been electrified or something. <laughs> right. No, I mean, usually the, the obligatory standing ovation can always be distinguished from the genuine one, because first of all, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen immediately. It happens like on the second curtain call or the third curtain call. Um, and secondly, it, it happens in waves. Yes. Rapidly spreading yes, waves, yes. perhaps, but waves. <laughs> Yeah. I want rapidly spreading waves of that instead of the rapidly spreading waves that we've been having, right? Oh, good God. <laughs> but I, I keep on, you know, looking for the silver lining, right? The, uh, the greater viewership, the, the people who before might have felt intimidated, but now know that, first of all, everybody's consuming the, the product music, um, you know, at home. Um, and so that they feel not only that they're still consuming it, but that they are part of a community of music lovers. Um, I, I, I feel some hope in, in the thought that uh, if we can stop being completely irrelevant in the everyday life um, of America, um, that there may be a future for arts organizations um, that we were just not able to, to see before the pandemic. And maybe people will realize the what we have potentially lost. I don't want to say what we've lost. I don't want to be that pessimistic but again maybe people will realize this is still here i can still go and do that yeah yeah still available 
Well, fingers crossed, first of all, um, and, you know, for every classical radio station in, in a landscape that seems to have, you know, lost them by the dozens back in the, uh, you know, in the aughts uh, and early teens, um, you know, first of all, thank you to WBJC. Thank you to you. Um, but also, you know, please keep doing what you are doing and, and spread your word far and wide. Well, thank you. I can tell you that there is no reason at this point to believe that we will do anything differently. Again, the, the listener support has been so phenomenal, not just the fundraiser that I told you about earlier, but even before that, once the pandemic began, we started getting phone calls and emails and letters like, are you guys okay? Are you safe? You know, people expressing not only gratitude for the music, but this tremendous concern for the staff. Um, the office staff has been working from home. The well, announcers have been... Solidarity. Sorry? A sense of solidarity between the staff, uh, the listeners. Yeah, exactly. And then knowing that people really care about us and not just the music uh, made it a little easier to to come into work every day when we weren't sure. It, it took about two, three weeks to get the rhythm down of, of communicating with the office staff from home and things like that. And, you know, wondering if we'd have to show paperwork to drive to work, if we, which never happened. But, in, you know, in the beginning, we knew where this was going. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, um, let's see, first of all, if there are any, um, if there are any viewer questions. Um, I'm not sure whether um, th my screen will remain up. Let me just try this. Um, okay. Hello. Um, we don't have any. We don't have any viewer comments today. But if you have any um, final points that you want to um, uh, say before we wrap up, um, you're free to do that. Or um, it depends on what you guys would <clears throat> feel like you want to take this discussion. Well, Dana, if, just if you. If you can draw some sort of a lesson for uh, a young, uh, you know, student who's wondering what the future could be in music, um, looking at your own experience, could you sort of summarize what what you would want them to know? Um. Oh, there are so 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 many things. Um, you have to think a lot about what you want as a person in terms not only of your career, but of your family life. And that may shift and that may change and that's okay. I know people that have had careers as singers, for example, underway, but then they realize that being on the road time will not give them the kind of family life that they want. Mm -hmm. And then I've by quite the opposite thing. And, and this goes for actors, singers, dancers, but again, most of the people that I interact with really closely have been actors and singers. So your, your priorities may change over time. Um, that There's nothing wrong with that. Not everyone makes it big, even if they're really fabulous. I've had colleagues that, you know, if, if I felt like we were living in a just universe, would have been singing leads at the Met for 20 years, but that hasn't happened for them. So it, it, it doesn't, um, don't, don't give up, don't get discouraged, keep going. And like we were saying earlier, be prepared to be versatile, be prepared to not have one type of performing be your whole income and you may end up teaching or with an office job or whatever. And again, there is absolutely nothing shameful in that all kinds of fabulously talented people do it. So you just have to keep going and not give up and be flexible. I, th I would say that that's a fairly important and, and central message. Um, it's it's a good note on which to wrap. So, first of all, thank you for making the time for us. Um, thanks for having. Me. Thanks, thanks for putting up with the various uh, technical uh, issues <laughs> at the beginning. Um, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to both seeing you again here, but also uh, hearing you on air. Um, you know, and, and talking to you there. Great. 10 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dana. Thanks, Thank you, Neil. viewers. Thank you, Mr. Shinoski. Thank you, Ms. Neil. That was a wonderful discussion. And for viewers at home, we'll see you next time. Till then. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Okay, bye.